fallacy in the world of ideas. Um, the uh, the notion that that uh, that we can bring together people in a nonpartisan context or a multipartisan context in some cases for independent thinking on crucial issues and come up with with ideas that are useful for policy. We're very pleased to be talking about the state of the border today. A report that has been produced by Arizona by NACS, the, NAC, the North American Center for Transborder Studies at the, at uh, Arizona State University. El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, the Northern Border College in Tijuana and throughout the northern border of Mexico, and the Woodrow Wilson Center's Mexico Institute. And you'll hear shortly from uh, the authors of this report, and, and very pleased. This has been a long-term effort. We've wanted to do this for years, and, and over the last year, they really put this together. We've been saying that we really need a diagnostic of where the U.S.-Mexico border is. When we talk about the border in this country, and also in Mexico, but especially in the United States, we tend to talk about it as a problem to be solved. The border is not a problem to be solved. The border is an opportunity. The border, first of all, is a place where real people live, by the way. For anyone here who's from the border, you know that. It is a, an actual space where real people live. But in terms of our larger two countries, the border is an opportunity. The border is an opportunity for economics. This is where the United States and Mexico come together. It's where a lot of economic creativity goes on. So a lot of interactions go on. If you are living in Nebraska or New Hampshire or Iowa or in Querétaro or in in Oaxaca or in Mexico City, you depend on the U.S.-Mexico border because it's part of the economic linkages between our countries. It is part of where people cross as they go across the border um, to start a life on one side of the, the in one country or the other. And but we should always remember there's about a half million to a million Americans in Mexico in addition to the 11 million or so of people born in Mexico in the United States. Um, it's a place that has real challenges and real opportunities. It has real challenges because borders inherently create challenges, right? You have federal governments who are involved in managing the border, often at conflict with, what, with the creativity that goes on in border communities themselves, and where real issues come to play. Things like organized crime use borders for their activities, which creates a set of real challenges. There are natural resource challenges at the border. How do you manage resources that are shared across the border? Because natural resources really know no boundaries. I, and Chris has heard this story a number of times, but I mean, one of my vivid memories was flying into to San Diego on my way to Tijuana at a time when there were enormous fires going on in the San Diego area. Eric will remember this. Um, and everything was closed in San Diego because of the smoke. Well, got across the other side of the border, and sure enough, in Tijuana, everything is closed as well. Why? Because even though the fires are on the U.S. side, natural resource questions don't tend to follow political boundaries, right? Well, this is true of water. This is true of, of sewage. This is true of the air we breathe. This is true of everything at the border, right? How we manage these natural resource processes is critical. So this is the first report that I think in many years that is comprehensive that tries to look at a set of issues. Um, in the U.S.-Mexico border region, it tries to look at it both from the perspective of border communities themselves and the challenges that they face and the opportunities that they have, and also how we manage this from the perspective of our federal governments and from our national political systems. Um, and hopefully it, it brings together some of the best wisdom from the border communities with some of the pressing challenges that people in the, in the two governments and the two societies are dealing with. It is my distinct pleasure to start this off. You will hear shortly from about the border report from some of its authors, but we're going to start off. We have a real pleasure to have two members of Congress who are co-chairs of the Congressional Border Caucus. We're both very distinguished members of Congress in their own right. I think everyone knows Raul Grijalva from Arizona and Filimon Vela from Texas. Um, they both have border districts. And um, I think we'll turn first to Congressman Vela to start off. Congressman, thanks for being with us today. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for in inviting us uh, it's been a pleasure to co-chair the Border Caucus with Congressman Grijalva and, uh, and have his guidance over the last four or five months. Uh, I'm kind of new to the world of policy. Uh, I spent 25 years as a plaintiff's trial lawyer in South Texas. And so really I come into Congress as more of a border resident and my, uh, my perspective on um, the ideas that uh, we have been discussing with Chris and Eric for the last a uh, few months is really that of somebody who just lived on the border for pretty much his entire life. I mean, my uh, great-grandparents, my first set of great-grandparents came in the 1860s into South Texas. Um, the next generation of grandparents came during and right after the Mexican Revolution. Uh, we are, are we have such a cross-border culture uh, along in the Rio Grande Valley, which is, uh, I represent the city of Brownsville and uh, Congress, you know, Hossa represents the city of McAllen, and of course our sister cities are 
Matamoros and Reynosa. And to give you an idea, his, his Congress in Hinojosa's father came with my grandmother from Reynosa to McAllen uh, back in the 1920s. You know, in the 1930s, my mom, who was born here in the 1940s when she was in elementary school, uh, although she was born in uh, South Texas, did her elementary education in Matamoros. And of course, later on in life in the 70s, you know, in the 70s, when I'm going through elementary and high school, I've got friends that uh, were, were born in Mexico but, and living in Mexico, but going to high school with me. And now they're doctors, lawyers, and uh, teachers uh, on, on our side of the border. So uh, I'm a real product of, uh, of our border. And, and, you know, now that I sit in this position as a potential policymaker and see uh, what has occurred, I kind of wish I'd been in this position uh, earlier on because. Um, what what I have seen, what what, uh, what it appears to me, at least in terms of how uh, our border policy has affected the area that I live, uh, really uh, has been a disaster. Because uh, it used to be, and in a very simple, in a very simple fashion. I mean, trade, uh, especially uh, a lot of retail trade um, along the the Rio Grande Valley. A lot of uh, in the old days, people from Mexico. Uh, would cross over just to do simple things like shop and eat, and we would do, uh, we would do uh, the same. Uh, we did it all the time, and you know, since uh, we started putting up border walls and all those sorts of things, and um, you know, all of a sudden we can't do that anymore. And I think it's just uh, <coughs> it's, it's, it's been disastrous for us, and in terms of the way uh, we used to live. I, I have not had a chance to go through this report because the last three weeks in Congress have been a little bit busy, but uh, <laughs> over this next week, I promised uh, Chris and Eric that I'll take a, a, a very good look at it. We had the pleasure of having uh, Chris with us in Brownsville for a border summit. Um, I, I, I think that I was recently asked um, by a reporter my thoughts on what is going on at the border that I live in. And, and I can tell you that um, we have some real serious issues in the Matamoros and Reynosa area in terms of cartel violence and um, economic insecurity. And I really believe that both countries uh, have an obligation to do something about that. And that's one of the things that I want to focus on. I think that uh, until we can um, uh, focus on improving uh, the economics for the people that live in the Matamoros Reynosa region, until we can uh, make sure that they feel safe. Uh, we're going to always have these constant pressures of, of people uh, wanting to, to come over. So I think there, there we, our relationship with Mexico is so complex, um, you know, and, and uh, it's a very engaging uh, relationship that we have. And I think that going forward, um, many of the ideas that, that Chris and Eric and I have talked about that I'm sure are part of this report uh, are the kinds of things uh, that I want to help uh, pursue. But again, thank you for having us, and um, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Congressman Grijalva, or my senior member of, of Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Congressman Vela is going to be a, a tremendous asset to, uh, to many discussions in Congress, but certainly for uh, uh, I'm proud to co-chair the, the Border Caucus with him, but it was his effort uh, as soon as he got there to revitalize what formerly was a kind of a morbid caucus. Uh, morbid in many ways, but it, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> nothing could be done because uh, we kept, couldn't stay on, t on topic, and, and, and we've, we're staying on topic, and that, that has a lot to do with this gentleman's leadership. Uh, I I skimmed the report, regret, regret to say, but I had Christina read the whole thing, so at some point <laughs> <laughs> I will be totally knowledgeable on this. It's a, it's a, the congressional offices are filled with 25-year-old young people that take care of uh, toddling old men like myself all day long, you know, feel like an assisted living center sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Very distinguished, 435-member <laughs> uh, assisted living center, yes. Very, uh, <laughs> Let me thank the partners, El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, uh, ASU, and the Transborder Research Center. 
Woodrow Wilson Center and, and the Mexican Institute here. Uh, very, very important contribution. Couple that with some studies that have been done on migration re recently, some polling that has been done in terms of border issues by Pew and others. Uh, couple that with some of the studies that have been done around the security measures, impact, and uh, you begin to get a very, very good picture. This is much more comprehensive, and uh, and, 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 and as such, I think, uh, deserves to be part of the discussion as we go forward. Uh, a resident grown up in, in the borderlands in Arizona, uh, and it always struck me, it struck me that you know, my parents are, mitad de la familia era Nogal Sonora, la otra mitad de Nogales, Arizona, and it was uh, ambos Nogales, they called themselves. They never made the separation. I think that's, that speaks a lot to uh, what the borderlands was and what the borderlands can be again. Uh, there was a, a codependency economically, culturally, historically, and uh, much of that has been frayed, as uh, the congressman just stated. And, and, and so these studies provide a, a, a groundwork on how to, for lack of a better word, how to move toward a, an area of recovery where you reintroduce the good aspects of what a borderland should be. And there is a litany of issues. Uh, congressman mentioned the violence associated with cartels, not just associated, because some of the safest cities in the United States are on the border. El Paso, Nogales, uh, Douglas, you can go all down the list where in within the community itself, it is safe and ranks high in this country uh, as safe communities. But the violence generated by organized crime is the violence that I think needs and the, uh, that needs the, the attention and the focus of uh, any law enforcement effort. But the issue of security is dealt with in this report, and that's important. The economic implications of a borderland that's vibrant for this country is important. Uh, sustainability, I was glad to see that that was part of the study effort. Uh, water, uh, transborder, public land issues that, that need to be dealt with. Uh, and because of uh, many factors, uh, but the primary one has been the whole issue about my migration and security, where suddenly the borderlands went from a unique American landscape, both people and history and, and uh, land itself, to a threat, to something to be feared. And we made that, making that transition uh, has affected this border tremendously. Uh, and, and you see it in the economic uh, downturn in many of these border communities, and you also see it in the stresses and pressures uh, on, on both sides of the border. So what the Border Caucus is doing is trying to redefine, redirect and refocus the conversation about the borderlands to, to talk about economics, to talk about opportunity, and to talk about what is possible and doable on those border communities, and the potential that's there. You know, when uh, Speaker Boehner has 125,000 people in his district that are directly dependent on trade with Mexico for their livelihood, I think people should pause and think about that. And uh, six million Americans depend on that, as the study pointed out. I, we're in the middle, we're in the throngs of this immigration reform just process right now to try to get some legislation. And we both desperately feel that something has to be done for the greater good to relieve some of the pressure. Uh, one of the big components is gonna be more security. For the life of me, I can't define what more means at this point because it's <laughs> quite a bit already. Uh, but more security. And we're trying to redirect that since, since the administration and, uh, and Secretary Napolitano will be responsible for what that plan is, to redirect it into infrastructure questions. Transportation, we see that as a security issue. Up-to-date, functional, efficient, expedited port of entries that have security as a major component, but also have the goods and services component that allows those communities to uh, develop economically. 
Uh, I think that focus is necessary in this whole discussion. It's always about boots on the ground, a fence, what technological detection we can put in there, and uh, ignoring the fact that part of the, the, the prevention of violence and the one of the deterrents for cross-border uh, unauthorized crossings is the fact that there is some level of economic security on both sides of the border. And the borderlands represent that opportunity for that growth. So uh, everyone should be very uh, proud of this study. I think it's a template that people should look at very seriously as we evolve the discussion of immigration reform. And by what I mean by evolve, make a component of that economic development as part of the security question uh, for our borderlands. Uh, I grew up on a ranch near Nogales, and uh, and you go back through those areas that I represent, like almost 80% of uh, the border along uh, US and, uh, and Arizona, and you see that uh, the spirit and is still there in those borderlands, but there's a level of exhaustion and a level of anxiety on both sides of the border about what's next. And I think we have an opportunity with this reform discussion to maybe move on, be definitive about what's next, lessen some of the anxiety, and then begin to plan for a different kind of future in the borderlands. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm an optimist about all these questions, and a little bit of a masochist too, but uh, <laughs> my wife said that it's a strange combination. I kind of enjoy the pain occasionally. But uh, I think the optimism for the borderlands is very is well rooted, and it's factual. The resilience of the people that live there is unbelievable, and uh, and the cultures that have mixed and matched the terrain and the landscape is unbelievable as well. Uh, one, and, and and so I think that if we can get away from looking at the borderlands as a threat and look at, at, at it as a, a tremendous, undeveloped, and untapped asset for the United States of America, uh, we'll go a long way. And I, obviously, key to that is begin to push the idea of the great potential economically that this region has for the entire United States. So thank you very much. Very kind of you to invite me, and give it back to you. Well, thank you, Congressman Grijalva, thank you, Congressman Vela, very wise words. And, and I think this is a report rooted in optimism. I should congratulate Chris Wilson, Eric Lee, by the way, who you'll hear from in a moment, who coordinated this project. It is rooted in optimism, rooted in real, in reality, and, and there are tough facts in here, and there's tough information, but ultimately it's a report that is, Congressman Grijalva said, it's, it's optimistic, and it, and it believes that border communities have something to offer to both countries in terms of our economic future, in terms of our security, in terms of our sustainability, and in terms of, of, of our future life. We have time for a couple questions for the members of Congress. If anyone would like to raise their hand, identify themselves, and ask a question. And thank you, by the way, for all of, us joining, all of you who are joining us via video conference. Um, we apologize we don't have a way for you to ask questions, but anyone in the room that wants to ask, please, please go ahead. The gentleman right here. Hi, I'm Nick Garver from Georgetown University. I wanted to reflect on what you said about how you know, all of 125,000 uh, members of Speaker Boehner's district are dependent on Mexico. And I think the point you're trying to make is that um, people should care about the border more than they actually do. But I wonder how, what specifically in this report or in your opinion do we need to how would you convince them? Because I think you could make that same argument about, you know, China or Canada or the Middle East or Venezuela or Nigeria. How do you specifically differentiate Mexico as being important in that regard? I'm going to take one more question before we go back to them. Does anyone else? Okay, well. Why does Mexico matter? I guess tell us, no, tell us why, does, I, why does the border matter for people who are far away? Because I, this is one of the challenges we face. I mean, and I think this report tries to set out and convince people is the border matters to people away from the border. They just don't realize it most of the time. Why? I, I, I begin with, with, the, with the assertion when we have these discussions with people that it's, you know, we're part of this hemisphere as well, the United States. And as being part of this hemisphere, uh, I think for a long time, as far as back as I can remember, there's been a, 
an interest in developing economic, political, diplomatic relationships with the world in general, ignoring at, at our own expense uh, the hemisphere that we're a part of. And I think uh, President Trips was very important uh, because he did talk about economics, and uh, and I and I would suggest that that I think that. Uh, you got to sell the sh selfish instinct. We're right here. It's it's in our neighborhood. We're part of this neighborhood, and the development of that is is critical. And 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 to the question, how do you convince? Uh, it's it, it's a difficult question because everything is mired in these discussions. But it's just fact and science, and that and, and everything was imperial imp imperial information. Yeah, you could do it. But it's mired in this whole other discussion that's political, it's ideological, and it has to do with immigration and what that means and doesn't mean to this nation. That's what taints the discussion. And, and I w use the word taint because you can't get past that to talk about this. If we get I think this report uh, gets us past that point. If we get immigration, well, Congressman Vela, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about the precise 125,000 figure, but. Um, I think one of the points that the congressman um, was making is something that I agree with. And if you if you go state by state and see what kind of economic impact trade with Mexico has, uh, beginning with Texas, um, Chris, you have a better um, you pr you probably know the statistics better than I do. But if, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's you know Texas and California, then states like Colorado and Michigan uh, rely heavily on on, tr on trade with Mexico. And I think probably uh, from a very, very basic standpoint, a lot of people don't know that. And I think one thing, um, and, and it's, it's maybe something that, 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 that we as representatives on the border or representatives of this country uh, need to do is to start educating people yeah. around the country, uh, whether they be in you know, the state of Washington, Ohio, North Carolina, uh, or whatever that might be, that uh, trade with Mexico is important, um, and and we, that's one thing I think that's it's just we know it because these guys and some of you probably write about it, uh, but letting the public real making the public know about those things I think is uh, one thing that we have to focus on and and try to message. If we uh, before I go to the woman with her hand raised over there. Let me ask you, if, we, if immigration reform gets done in Congress, and you guys are in a better situation than we are to, to know if this will go through the, the House, it looks like it will go through the Senate, will that change the narrative on the border? Does that open up opportunities to talk about the border in a different way? Because right now we think when most Americans, you know, probably accepting people in this room, think about the border, they're thinking about the immigration debate. They're not thinking about the way that their job may be tied to Mexico or, or things that they produce in, in the, the town they live in actually depends on exports to Mexico as part of a production process. Will that change the debate if, if immigration reform gets done? Congressman, do you please? Okay. Um, I, I don't know. What, what, I, what I think is that um, the, the process is well underway. Uh, Congressman Grijalva and I are not uh, part of the team uh, that are currently negotiating the immigration package in the House. Uh, I came in with the belief that uh, although all these things are interrelated, that uh, to condition uh, a pathway to citizenship on findings of border security, which are very difficult to measure, uh, really didn't make any sense. I've always thought that those are two different things and that we ought to be approaching those two things uh, differently. That being said, the reality of the politics uh, in Congress is that uh, the two things are tied together, um, and 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 we're just going to. Uh, Congressman Gutierrez and Congressman Becerra are part of the House group. Mm -hmm. uh, we met with them yesterday. Um, <coughs> we're, we're the group of negotiators are uh, being very tight-lipped. They've got a, they've got a deal amongst themselves that they won't reveal the details until mm -hmm. they either know that they have a deal or know that they're not going to have one. And you know it, uh, what you see in the media is pretty much what uh, what we know. I asked Congressman Gutierrez on the House floor this morning how things going. He says well, we're going back to meet. So they're working 
they're working real, real hard to get something done. Um, but Congressman Cahalva? Yeah, I, th that's, th I think Congressman is accurate. I, uh, dealing a little bit with, uh, if, if something were to get done, uh, how would it change uh, the rest of the discussion about the borderlands? Uh, at the very minimum, the tone would change. And, and I think that's important, uh, that uh, now you would have more room to talk about other things, present sub subject included, than you have had up to this point. And so the tone would change. It wouldn't be such a narrow conversation. And uh, there'd be a little more openness to listen to some of the economic realities of the situation than there is present. So in that sense, it, it loosens some pressure, and I think that's good. Uh, with regard to what could happen, I, you know, the, the template for me is the Senate bill. Uh, what the House is going through right now is going to be difficult. We have, we have a much more, a larger and more <coughs> resistant strain, <laughs> strain of uh, Congress's, members of Congress to immigration reform, and they're going to be very active and vocal in the House. Uh, I, I would suggest that it, as you look at the two bills, and if there are two bills, uh, that the House version will be harsher and uh, more restrictive. Uh, Mr. Goodlatte uh, already filed a bill in his own committee, Chairman Goodlatte, saying that you can have a path to citizenship, but you're always going to be a legal permanent resident because the opportunity, you can have a pathway to legalization, but there will be no pathway to citizenship. And that in itself is going to create. But it's been a compromise, as, as, as the congressman said, it, it's been a compromise. There's been bitter pills to swallow as we've gone through here. Uh, but uh, at some point, uh, we're all going to be confronted with a decision. And I hope that at the end of the day that the template that we're dealing with is more Senate side than what potentially could come out of the House. Thank you. Thank um, I think she had a question. To change, uh, we, should we take one more question or should we move on to the... Okay, Francisco Lara, by the way, and Carlos de la Parra, two of the authors, have joined us from uh, Arizona State and from Tijuana, uh, from Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Good to have you here. And thank you, thank Congressman you. Vela, thank you, Congressman Vijalva, for joining us today and for your remarks. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. And receiving you at, at future events here. We hope you can join us more often. Thank you. Thanks. No.